Hi, welcome to the Sigma Path. In this episode, we're going to do one of the things that I often get a request for from Patreon, and that is to do more reverse engineering of some ASICs that you could buy off the shelf or something interesting and unique. So I went ahead and I got four components. These are all off the shelf. You can either buy them from Mauser or from DigiKey, and I'm going to use only my own knowledge to reverse engineer them. There's absolutely nothing confidential that I have access to from these companies. This is just purely from observation. So let's go ahead and spin the wheel and see which one we're going to do today. And here we go. So what are we going to get? We're going to remove from the list for next time. Let's see what we're going to end up with. And what do we have here? Well, we have the ADI's 81 to 86 gigahertz IQ receiver. This is a gallium arsenide chip, and we actually don't even have to decap it because I have it in a die form. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. So here's a block diagram of the system that we're going to be looking at. So it's actually a little bit more than the, the die itself because this system includes two ICs and here they're showing both of those at the same time. So at the bottom over here, let's just ignore that for now. This is a low noise amplifier. It's a four stage low noise amplifier that gives the performance of this entire receiver. Its noise figure is about 6 dB or so and its input compression points. Everything that's associated with the front end of the receiver. We're going to be focusing on everything that's at the top over here, which is a complete IQ down converter operating in the 81 to 86 gigahertz bands. So basically it's going to have an RF input, which is the normally the LNA output, and we're going to see this on the die itself, where that starts. And then we also have an LO input, which is at one sixth of the frequency, because there is a times six multiplier here in the chain. Now this times six multiplier is itself made of two multipliers as we will see on the die. We'll take a look and see how that architecture actually looks like. Then we have some quadrature hybrid splitters and then of course we have our IQ mixer. So this die actually does provide IF differential I and Q output. So these guys go out when you apply an RF signal into this port which is going to be between 81 to 86 gigahertz and when the LO is of course present. And as I said earlier, this is a gallium arsenide process. It's a p hemp transistor based design. So we're going to see that and it's going to be very obvious once you look at it, it does have the, the unique color. Now one of the really nice things about reverse engineering gallium arsenide or indium phosphide or gallium nitride, which are the three five processes is that they don't really have a lot of metal layers. They only have maybe two, maybe three if you're lucky. And as a result, it's really easy to see what's going on because they cannot hide many layers behind each other. So the architecture almost looks like exactly what's drawn here. So it's really easy to reverse engineer. And these chips are often not flip chipped, which means that they're facing upwards and they're wire bonded. So it's even easier because it's going to be so clean to look at the die as we will see using the microscope. Now I'm not going to do the LNA this time, we're going to have to find the LNA chip separately. We'll think about how that looks like later on and we'll reverse engineer that too. But let's go ahead and take a look and see what this looks like under the microscope because there's a lot of little things that we can talk about and reverse engineer just by looking at it. And here's the die. Look at it. Looks really nice. I tried to clean it a little bit because it was dirty and there's a little bit of mark left on it. But you can see the wire bonds, they're the dark ones and we will change the microscope settings to be able to take a better look at it. You're looking at a magnification of about 30. I actually wrote a little GUI to run this microscope. I like writing little GUIs for instruments. So you can control the microscope and when you change the lenses you can see what's selected. You have essentially complete control over all of its settings. So right now we're looking at the two and a half times uh, objective which is the smallest one. So having said that, let's go ahead and minimize this so it gets out of the way. So here's the entire die and we can begin reverse engineering and taking a look at how things work. Now if you're familiar with any ASIC design at these frequencies or in general, it should kind of pop out of the page exactly what's going on because it is essentially very simple. So we have our RF input here that's going this way and you can see that it goes in and it splits into two. It has to because it needs to go to two mixers, one for I, one for Q. And right away that means that these lines, these dark lines which are the wire bonds are actually the IQ signals going out. So that you'll have the signal Q over here and the signal I over here. So we'll, we'll zoom in a little bit more to take a closer look at it. And then on this side, you have another signal coming in, and this signal is going to be our LO. So that means that we have the LO coming in from the left side of the chip, RF coming from the right side of the chip, and the IF leaving from the right side of the chip. And everything else in the middle, actually most of this area is just the LO multiplier because it has to be filtered and it has to have a large amplitude to hit the mixer because the mixer is essentially passive. So let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit more so we can take a closer look at it. But before I do that, maybe we can switch quickly to dark field because in dark field, you will be able to immediately see the impact of the wire bonds here. All right, here we go. So in dark field, things look very different. And in here, you can see all of the, let me set the brightness back up. You can see all of the wire bonds highlighted. Now in dark field, you're only looking at scattered light. So the 
wire bonding and the ribbon bonding really, really comes out of the page. And it's really easy to see how nicely it is done. So the, the chip looks dark now, of course, because it's, it's, it, most of the light reflects perfectly vertically from the surface of the chip. But right away, you can notice that we have a ribbon bond on the LO input and a ribbon bond on the RF input. That's because these are very difficult transitions. They're much, much higher frequency than everything else. These ones over here are just biased. And these two longer wire bonds are IF, which are the fraction of the frequency of everything else. But you can kind of see how the back of the Gallimard chip is glued down. And yep, it's very straightforward. Nothing really strange about its design. And we're going to be able to take a close look at all of the internal structures. So let me go ahead and zoom in. So here we're looking at magnification of about 60 or so, and we are still in dark field. And you can see all the little dirt and debris that has landed on top of the die because it scatters the light, and you can see it. And that stain looks very different too, because you're only looking at the scatter light through it. I really like these microscopy techniques. They really bring out so many details, and they're all done, of course, in free space optics. There's no digital processing or anything at all. It's really always so cool to see. So let's go back to our bright field. And here we go. So in Brightfield, now we're going to analyze the LO input and see what kind of stuff we're actually dealing with. So we're going to write on the screen again. So we have LO coming over here, and this LO needs to be multiplied. Now first it's going to be multiplied by a factor of 3, and then by a factor of 2, which in total, of course, gives you the times 6 multiplication. Now when you, when you apply the LO input, you want to have a reasonable input amplitude, so you're first going to amplify it. And it's going to provide a nice way of having a, a good range of input LO that you could apply. So the very first amplification stage is done right over here. So that's an amplifier. And this amplifier has got some input matching. You can see the inductor for that input matching. Now afterwards, they're going to go to the second stage. Now, if you notice, when you look at the inductor here, and you look at the inductor here, you can see how much the inductor on the left side is larger than on the right side. And that should already tell you that there is some frequency change happening between these two portions of the circuit. Otherwise, you won't be able to match the circuit at the correct frequency by changing the inductance value so much. So this is our tripler. The frequency tripling happens in this stage. And afterwards, that tripled frequency, which is now at a much higher frequency, is going to throw around 40 gigahertz or so, is going to need a much smaller load inductance. And that's what this is. And that's our first clue that we have our multiply by 3 right over here. Now, once you multiply by 3, you want to boost that again so that you can multiply it once more, this time by a factor of 2. So we do have some amplification stage over here, and you can see that these two inductors are actually very similar in size, and that's because they're operating at around the same frequency. That's all you really need to look for to see where these frequency changes are happening. And since there's only one metal layer, the top metal layer they're using, and the other one has a different color, you can see it's lower, it's pretty easy to follow. And afterwards, you boost this twice, there's one more amplification here. So now that tripled frequency, which when you do the tripling, actually has a loss in there, so the amplitude becomes small, and then you multiply it with the amplification, you bring it all the way back up again, so you can hit the doubler, with a lot of amplitude once more so that you can afford to be able to double the frequency once again. And that's done over here. So here's a double frequency that is times two. And once you double the frequency afterwards, your load inductances will become even smaller. And you can see how much smaller they are over here now. And this is actually a coupler. So you're coupling that into the next stage. And this coupler is tuned to make sure that you get rid of the fundamental frequency too. So you're, you preserve a nice clean 80 gigahertz tone or 80 between 81 to 86 gigahertz signal that's going to go directly into your down convert mixer because this is a fundamental down convert mixer now you're going to need a lot of amplitude as we will see why because you're going to split that signal multiple times so you look how large these stages are these two amplification stages are much much bigger they have a lot more pm devices and they generate a lot more power it's interesting this looks like there is an rc uh, feedback in this stage that is wrapped around the transistor itself could be done for a few different reasons, could be for filtering, could be for stability or for peaking and so on. This uh, could be introducing uh, poles, for example, in the actual uh, circuit and then a zero in the uh, feedback circuit. So there's some techniques to do that in order to boost the performance. But the second stage doesn't actually have it. So then you amplify again. So this is just another amplifier and then followed by yet another amplifier. And then afterwards, now we have a nice, clean, strong LO signal that we want to apply to our mixer. So everything that is done on the left side is basically amplify, triple, amplify, amplify, double, amplify one more time, and then one more time, and then go towards the mixer. So let me clear all of this from the screen over here, which I think I should be able to do if I can figure out how. There we go. So let's pan a little bit and then look and see what happens on this side. Okay, so now we have an LO signal, and we can follow that LO signal one more time and see what it does actually 
to the to the circuit. So we couple one more time into this. There we go. That's our strong alloy signal. Now this structure over here is a Langer coupler. A Langer coupler is a four-port structure that allows you to couple a signal in and out into a quadrature signal generation. So the four ports, this port is the couple port. I'm going to have a 90 degree phase coming out of this one. If I can write 90 over here. We have a zero degrees reference phase over here, and this is our isolated port. Now normally when this everything is well matched, there is nothing dissipated in this isolated port, but generally you need to put something, of course. And there is a little bit of an uh, RC circuit over here to absorb any reflection. So this is the first and the most important step because you're converting the yellow signal into zero and 90 degrees. That's a quadrature signal. You need that to produce a good image rejection. You also need the amplitude to be very well matched so that you can have an overall good image rejection. But this actually doesn't solve a problem completely because the signal coming this way and the signal coming that way are in quadrature, but they're still single-ended. And the mixer is balanced. You need a differential signal. And then we have a balance over here. So this structure over here is a single-ended to differential converter. So the signal comes over here, it couples partially in here, and it couples partially to the other one, but they do it at 180 degrees out of phase. So you could get a zero degrees over here, you could get 180 degrees down here, which is very hard to write with the mouse. And now you have 0, 180, 90, and 270. You need the four phases required to do a balanced down conversion. Now, interestingly, on the other side, we have the RF coming in. And this RF is at 86 gigahertz. We have a stub, butterfly stub here. This is probably to get rid of any other frequency going back out, which you don't want to leak back out of the circuit. Probably filters everything out, as well as ensuring that you're able to get uh, a, a nice a signal filtering, so if there's any spurious strings coming in, it also gets rid of it. And uh, remember that the DLO and the RF are at the same frequency, so this is mostly just to get rid of out-of-band frequencies. Then what, we're over, what we have over here is the Wilkinson divider. We go this way, and we go that way, and the Wilkinson divider has a load, of course, in the middle, and all of the dimensions of these can be mathematically calculated uh, because these are distributed components, which makes the design so much easier. And then over here, the signal comes back here, and then here's our passive mixer transistors, here and here, and then two more, once again, here and here. And then the IF signals are generated, going back out. You can see the line is much thinner, and that helps also filtering things out. That's because the frequency of the IF is so much smaller. And that is the entire down converter. So signal comes in, multiply by six, split into a quadrature, passive mixer, RF goes in, splits in phase, goes into the transistors, IF comes out on the other side. And that's it. That is your quadrature down converter, IQ, in gallium arsenide. So this obviously is not a very highly integrated circuit. If you were to make this in silicon, for example, you would make it much more complex, and you would put calibration and a whole bunch of other things in there, which we, of course, always do when we make these kind of circuits as well. Let's go ahead and erase everything on the screen over here. We can go in and zoom in one more. Let's focus on that. There it is. So now you can see a little bit better the actually PM devices. You can also see a bit better. Here's our termination of our quadrature splitter over there, which is kind of neat to see. Now let's see, there's our devices for our mixer. Also pretty neat to see. What else do we have here that could be interesting? So we can also look at the diffraction interference contrast, the DIC microscope, and you can see the surface imperfections here which might be quite interesting. Let's switch that over. And we can turn the polarization, the prism, a little bit and see some more interesting details come out. There you go. Now you can see the surface roughness of the metal a little bit better. There we go. That itself is a quite neat feature of the metals. You can see that over here on the wire bond as well. Very, very cool. Now there was somewhere in here that there was a, a, some damage to the surface. For example, here, you can see, even though these metals look like over here, that they're very smooth, they actually aren't very smooth. And the DIC technique brings them out, brings all those imperfections out. Yeah, there you go. You can see it very clearly now of what's going on. Here's our butterfly stub filter. It's on a different metal layer, which is interesting. It would be hard to put it in the same metal layer because it will interfere with this line over here. 
And if you go down, there's some capacitive and resistive components for the biasing there. And apparently this has been, at some point, probed, because these pads, which I think are ground, have already been probed. There you go. There's another probe over here. Here's a transition, the crossover between the lines. Very, very interesting. And these resistive components themselves are quite interesting too. Now we can switch to dark field in this mode, and that should give us some other features too. There we go. So here's some more dark field view. Look at some of the features and all the dirt and debris. And the chip isn't actually completely flat because I, as I span left and right, I'm going to have to adjust the focus occasionally. Yeah, it is very neat. So I think that about that's about it. This is not a very complex chip. The other ICs on the list that I want to take a look at are considerably more complex. They're not actually in Gallium Arsenide. They're not in 3.5 devices as far as I know. So it should be interesting once we get to it. But as always, let me know in the comment section what you think about this. If you like this kind of video, kind of uh, just me walking over it, thinking out loud, and talking about the components, let me know and we will do more of it. And as always, I'll see you in the comment section.